Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan Roth, and uh, on the line here is South Florida Tribune contributor Jake Ronhold. Glad to have you on here, Jake. Uh, it's great to be on, Scott. I mean, I'm starting to, to feel like we're getting back into the sports talk here. We got some spring training baseball. Just got back from Tampa Bay and uh, feeling good right now. Very good. So, what was that experience like being a runner for the New York Yankees? It was a lot of fun. I was part of the Yes Network and I uh, had some good bosses. Uh, you know, it, it was just, you know, a couple of little things here and there, but I won't lie to you. They got a, a beautiful baseball field for their Class A team, the, the Tampa Tarpons. So it's uh, it was really fun and uh, a lot of things that I learned. Got some good networking and go from there. So Let me give you a little experience. Once upon a time, yours truly covered the New York Yankees when they were at Fort Lauderdale Stadium. Uh, then when I went from Fort Lauderdale, I moved to Tampa. They had Al Lopez Field, and the name of that team was the Tampa Tarpons, but they were affiliated with the Cincinnati Reds. So, my goodness, uh, now I really feel like I'm playing the age cards. <laughs> All good. All right, but meanwhile, uh, you uh, had some interesting observations about why the star players went too far in the CBA opposition. Uh, go ahead and give us more about that. Well, once again, we're on another episode of Billionaires versus Millionaires. Now, the good news is about the CBA for the NFL. Let's first off talk about that. They now make they make sixteen billion annually. They'll make twenty five billion coming up here in twenty twenty one. Now let's go to the player side. They'll make five billion extra per year. They'll make eight hundred thousand dollars extra on their salary. I mean, the lowest paid player in the NFL is four hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. So this will help those lower players. I thought Aaron Rodgers did a good job. He, he didn't go on Twitter or anything like that. He talked to Rod Domowski of ESPN, and he said that he was against this. In fact, he was the player rep of the 32 that voted on this thing, and he was part of the 14 that said no. He was the Green Bay Packers rep. But it was a 17-14-1. It got lucky that this even got past it, and now it's going to continue. But 2,000 players are going to go through this. They're going to take their time, and you only need 50% agreement. You get that, and the CBA is going. So I did appreciate the way Aaron Rodgers took it. I love that Russell Wilson did it because he didn't have to go on Twitter. He just told a reporter, he says, I'm not, I'm not for this. I don't agree with this. But then Marquise Pouncey, the same guy that, that believed that Aaron Hernandez was in a sense, a couple of years ago, does this brain dead idea where he decides to go full on Antonio Brown and go on Facebook Live. He is shirtless, he's in a Hummer, and he is, you know, talking, and he's uh, using curse words and all this kind of stuff, and he is absolutely embarrassing himself. Now, I had to go back and say, okay, how much is Aaron Rodgers making? Aaron Rodgers is making 28, 25 million this year. Uh, Russell Wilson is making $31 million, including $9 million off the field. And now Marquise Pouncey making $11 mil. There are players out there that are not making those contracts. In fact, there's the top 2% that are, that are making the most money in the NFL. So now you're making yourself look foolish. Now you're telling these second-year, third-year, fourth-year players, undrafted players, that we don't care about you that we don't want you getting raises, that we don't want you to be able to make a good living. Because, I mean, being in the NFL, you're the top 1% of athletes that get this opportunity to do this. So you basically went way too far with this, and you decided to become this guy on a soapbox who already is making all this millions of dollars. This is the same pounds that made a five-year, $42 million contract in 2014 signed a two-year extension that is worth $11 million a year. So forgive me on that, but I feel like that went way too far, and then it really started to show the hypocrisy of the players that were having this issue. You're not the leaders. The ones that were the leaders were the player reps of the NFL Players Association. Another thing, Demora Smith, who was part of the weakest union in sports, the number one is NBA. Number two is Major League Baseball. Number three, for crying out loud, is the NHL. And number four is the NFL because the Players Association has no power because of the current CBA that they got themselves into. That they did not get these raises and have forgot one major
major thing, which we'll get into throughout this time. Okay. Well, let me tell you this. When you talk about the four major sports, keep in mind, Jake, that the NFL only has 16 games and potentially 17. So when you lose a game check, that's one sixteenth out of your salary. So what do you right. expect, okay, about them being weak, you know? When they lose, they lose big. This is one of the few uh, players' associations where the, actually the union got broken for a long time. And let me tell you, these guys are walking the picket line. And if you need a reminder or do some research, Joe Montana was the guy that actually walked the picket line. And many others followed after that. So, you know, I, I, it's one thing to play 162 games or 80-plus games where the game checks right. aren't as magnified. But in the NFL, 116th is quite a bit of money to lose. And the amount of money you'll lose, it's impossible to make that up. So just keep that in mind. Now, yeah. to, to DeMora Smith's credit, okay, he seemed optimistic that this thing will go through. And before you came on tonight here on the Sports Exchange, I had former Detroit Lions quarterback Eric Hiffel, and I asked him what he thought about the potential 17-game season, and he had no problem with it because back th then, okay, they were doing two and three days, and then at that point, there were not only did they have four preseason games, but many years ago prior to that, they had 16 and the workouts were so much more intense. Now, you know, the league is slacked off a little bit where they're not doing two or three day practices. So it's a different animal. And by eliminating that fourth preseason game, you're taking, if you're going to get injured, at least get paid to do it. And I, I think the one thing I remember was back in 1979 when former Detroit Lions quarterback Gary Danielson was done for the uh, year after playing a game against the Baltimore Colts. The Lions had to go to Joe Reed, and then they had to go to little-known Jeff Comlow out of the University of Delaware, the Blue Hands. So they were in deep trouble back then. So what I'm trying to tell you, Jake, is times have changed, and when you, the reality is, is these game checks are much, much bigger. And, you know, with the less physical toll it takes on you, I, I think the players should go ahead and accept this agreement. Uh, I think they're talking about over the life of the deal, what, getting 3 to $5 billion more in their pocket. And this agreement's designed to take care of a lot of the core players is what it's really designed to do so that you have balance throughout. And I don't know the logistics of the deal, but I understand this one's designed to also take care of the uh, uh, pl players that will be former players in due time, which is where a lot of the deficiencies occurred with the last agreement. Continue okay. on. Yeah, and I understand that J.J. Watt and Rodgers and Wilson, I mean, they all want to come out, and I understand what they're trying to do here. But they just overplayed their hand, and Marquise Pouncey did not need to go out on some rant on Facebook Live and get all of these Fall City, you know, hey, I agree with you, yeah, power to the people, Pouncey, and all that. But the fact is, is that this is actually a better deal than I thought it was. I thought, for me, and I told you this on last week's show, that I felt like this was not going to pass. But the Players Association, the reps, the 32 player reps are out there, including Matthew Slater and Rodgers and Russell Wilson and all that. They all went at this in 17-1, and that's all they needed out of it. Now you're finding out even more about this deal. They eliminated the $250,000 cap on Week 17 game. It'll be 14 playoff teams. They'll also have less padded practices. So they'll go from 29 pra padded practices to 16. Which means now that offseason program is going to take a massive overhaul, which also is going to force players that are not in that, that top 1% that are going to have to watch their bodies because now injury is going to become more probable as the season goes on with less pra padded practices. And you talked about it with Eric Hipple, who knows about this because, I mean, these were rough and tough uh, practices. you got to go back to the 1990s for crying out loud. When Dick Vermeil ran the St. Louis Rams into the ground for three practice, three hour practices, and when they didn't like it, he turned two practices and used the first, the third practice, put it into those two two hour practices to get what he needed out of it. And that is what it used to be. It is not like that anymore. And now this deal is actually pretty golden, and this is pretty much the best the players are going to get going forward. But now. I read something up on Jerry Jones opening his mouth here. 
the more people that continue to open their mouths on both sides, this thing is just going to be a colossal mess right now. The best bet is to shut up, let the players vote on this, get this thing over with so we can get started into free agency and move on from there and enjoy this NFL offseason. That's how I look at it. Well, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, one thing that I really totally agree with you, uh, and that's the fact that uh, – the one, there was one thing, a uh, big thing missing uh, from the CBA that no one has brought up. You talked about the fact that you have bigger names opposed to the deal. You know, but again, the bigger names should be opposed to the deal. You know why? Because they stand probably more to lose in the event of an injury anyways, but forget about the other guy. So, but I don't have a problem with fewer padded practices. Many years ago, Jake, I worked with Don Shula and they used to call his uh, training camps called Camp Shula. And if you want to visualize <laughs> it, that was about let your imagination run amok. Weren't those uh, three-a-day practices oh, that you bet. Do, uh, on the Dolphins? Yeah, I got to tell you a funny story back then. Once upon a time, I myself got injured playing a soccer game, you know, with the Fort Lauderdale Strikers against the Fort Lauderdale Strikers staff. And I ended up going to uh, the Dolphins camp on crutches. And let me tell you, when Do we were on a r rainy day over at Biscayne College, Shula got to know me, got to like me back then. Think about it, the first co coach I ever worked with was Don Shula. And he says, so he takes myself and another writer in his office. And boy, I wish I would have had camera phones back then, but didn't. And he says, should I put you on injured reserve or should I wave you? And I looked at Coach Shula and said, you know, Coach, I wouldn't mind going on injured reserve. I don't want to get waved. And then he gave me that big old Papa Shula smile that softened his butt up, and it was pretty good stuff. So, but, okay. So, but also another thing that people are forgetting about, and these players are just got to still understand, that the guaranteed contracts are still not there. In fact, the guaranteed contracts that were there in the 1990s and the early 2000s have been gone since 2011 when they signed that deal. They basically took away a large percentage of power away from the NFL Players Association that the late Gene Upshaw busted his tail to get up to that great level where Tony Clark is with the Major League Baseball, where NHL is right now, with what the NBA is doing right now. And now that's gone. And now these guaranteed Guaranteed contracts can turn into one-year deals. They can take a player, throw him out on the street, and then basically say, all right, he's up for grabs for $25 million. You guys want him for $25 million? All right, you want to auction it off? Okay, well, let's do it for $24. You got $24, I got $24. You want $24, let's go to $23, $22, $22, let's go to $21, $21. And, you know, it's becoming that now. And I understand that the players want more out of this, but like I said, looking through this contract, it feels good. And it feels right, and it's going to get done. But the only thing I have a problem with, and that a lot of NFL reporters did not talk about, was the lack of guaranteed contracts that continue to be a problem in the NFL because there are only two players, count them, two players that have two fully guaranteed contracts. Vikings quarterback Kirk Cousins and Falcons wideout Julio Jones. That is amazing to me going forward into the uh, new decade. Okay, Jake, I want you to clarify why the NFL continues to be a underutilized mess and uh, talk about your final shot at the dead zone of sports talk. I was kind of wondering about that, so now you can have a chance to let the listeners know what you uh, were meaning by that. Well, let's go back to the Players Association once again. As I mentioned, I mean, they're the ones who let this deal in 2011 happen. They're the ones that lost the power that pretty much underutilized Gene Upshaw's hard work that he was committing in 1982 and 1987 NFL strikes, that he was able to continue this strong relationship he had with NFL Commissioner Paul Tagliabue, and then was able to push in uh, when DeMora Smith was going to go in with Roger Goodell, and then something just happened, and they split apart, and they never came together as this, and now you're coming back to this once again, this hypocrisy this underutilization of understanding what players truly and actually need, even though you had 32 player reps out there, you're still not getting the job done. And then you go to these 2,000 players, and now you got guys like Pouncey and Rogers and Wilson 
all coming out. And you have a couple of them making sense. Richard Sherman as well. And then you got Marquise Pouncey opening up his big fat mouth and not committing anything except a reason for these young players. And another thing is, too, this NFL Players Association went through 10 months of negotiating for this thing. Okay? And if these players seriously don't get what they want out of this, then we're going to have a stoppage. And that's going to be blamed to Eric Winston and Demora Smith once again because you need to be that strong players union that basically tells the commissioner, look, we're just as strong as you, and if you can't get this thing passed, this will be such a mess going into 2021 because then and now you're going to be under the gun again. You're going to go back to 2011, and we're going to be sitting there going, oh, my goodness, are we going to have football this year? We're waiting. We're waiting. And then at the ninth hour, bang, they were able to get the deal. Thank goodness. They have a golden opportunity now to get this thing passed 50% and move on from there. If this thing doesn't pass, it's going to fall on the NFL Players Association, and they will have to de- maybe possibly look at better representation if they don't get this thing passed. Another thing is, with the dead zone of sports talk, it is amazing to me how many times I have heard this. I am hearing. Dan Patrick was one of my big-time mentors at the Dan Patrick School of Sports Casting. I remember very well when he told us that he cannot stand the two words, I'm hearing, because that means that his this reporter's source is coming out with this kind of stuff. There was a story about Brady possibly going to the New York Giants. The same New York Giants that were 5-11 and 11 last year that didn't know how to utilize their top player in Saquon Barkley that just cut Alec Ogletree and Kareem Martin, two players that they signed two years ago when Dave Gettleman took the chair as general manager of the New York Giants. And now you're trying to tell us, okay, this is a story, Jake. We want you to talk about this. Dan Patrick brought up a great point. I don't want to hear I'm hearing. I want to hear reports. I want facts. I want understanding to this. I mean, Ian Adam Schefter got a stat wrong when he was talking about how how uh, the NFL was going to get, you know, going to get the biggest increase in history when it came to the percentage they were getting. That was untrue. Sports Track came out and said that the NBA and Major League Baseball were the ones that had the players getting the bigger piece of the pie now. And that was something that really just shocked me. And it just continues to be this dead zone of sports talk. I understand. I'm trying to get into this business myself. And if I was a sports reporter, I would not be going down the road of I'm hearing. I want good, solid facts to storytelling. Okay? When you tell a story, you don't want to be about putting fantasies out there. Otherwise, you're going to be nothing better than a sitcom flashback when they talk about their side of the story and then it becomes a different side. That's ridiculous. That's why you got to get both sides of the story and you got to be brave about it. And I just feel like we're not doing that anymore. And it saddens me to say because, man, we had rumors about Tom Brady going to the Cowboys. We had uh, talks about uh, Joe Burrow not going to the Bengals. Uh, there was just so much unbelievable sports talk where you just sat there and went, Who to believe anymore? We don't need to get back to this. We don't need to go down the road that political news has become. Fake news. We don't know what to believe anymore. I don't want to see that happen with sports reporting because there are fantastic sports reporters out there. There are reasons why Jay Glazer is one of the tops in the business. There are reasons that there are guys like him, that Real Sports of Brian Gumbel has such a great following. That guys like James Brown has such a solid uh, foundation underneath them. And we need to get back to that. When you tell a story, make sure you have both sides. Don't need hot takes. Just need to get through this. And if it's a dead zone of sports talk, like I said before, we're getting into the point where baseball is starting up, where free agency is going to start getting hot for the NFL, and going forward. But I'll say something that Patrick said perfectly. We can't report a story, but we want to have stories happen. We want Tom Brady to go to another team so we have something to talk about. Well, let me tell you something. Sometimes something that you wish sometimes just doesn't come true. Well, I will say this much. You're talking about a lot of national people. Unfortunately, 
I've seen the uh, other side with a lot of new local newspapers dying and a lot of guys taking out buyouts before their time. So there's no question that the news cycle has changed because of the way things have uh, unfortunately turned for the worse in newspapers. But, yeah, I, I don't think you can ever have enough, uh, you know, good news reporters. And it's good that you're still trying to work towards accomplishing your dream to go out there and do it. And, and, and there has to be responsible journalism out there to make it credible. You know, being a young, aspiring broadcaster like you are, we have about two minutes to go. I want to relay a story to you that I think you could probably relate to. Whether you know the individual or not, well, nowadays in the Google age, you can always find it. But during the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan back in 1981, uh, mm-hmm. ABC Nightline's Frank Reynolds blew a gasket on the air, and he didn't want to be first. He just wanted to be right. And I'll tell you what, he ripped his crew like you wouldn't believe because they – had talked about James Brady being dead and all of a sudden they, everything had to be re, retracting it. And, you know, again, uh, Brady ended up being paralyzed and Reynolds just say, Hey, listen, I don't want to be first. I want to be right. And you know what? I've always respected that. If you're ever looking for good reading material, you should ever uh, look up Dan rather the camera never blinks. And those are things that I tell people. And one of the first lessons that you grow up with in our business, Jake, is Marshall McLuhan, the the medium is a message, although now we're taking it to a much different level than we ever uh, did when I started going to college in 1981. We know where you were not on this planet. But you get the message? Oh, no doubt. Yeah, so, so in the eyes of Frank Reynolds, okay, the camera... Uh, he was upset, uh, notably so, and I think people have to be more responsible. And sort of about fake news, take your time to get it right in a 24-7 news cycle. I agree, and I understand it's a 24-7, 365 day a year news cycle. I understand that, but there are far better stories out there to talk about. It's why I like shows like Part of the Interruption with Michael Wilbon and Tony Kornheiser, because they bring up stories that I'd never heard of. I didn't hear about a report about how the NHL was against uh, possi- might possibly get rid of the emergency goalies because of what Dave Ayers did with uh, during the Maple Leafs game and was winning winning that game for the Carolina Hurricanes. I didn't hear about that. I didn't hear about it until PTI where I sat there and went, well, where was this story all day? Why were we talking about Tom Brady possibly going to the Giants or right. anything like that? I mean, my goodness. Why was there no, no conversation about you know, what the NBA right now is dealing with, which is something actually pretty good. You know, you had Bucks Raptors. You had Zion Williamson versus LeBron James. You still have that conversation about load management. I want to have meat to these details. And if you just give me this scratch on the surface stuff, this is why we have these rants going on right now in sports talk. And it's why we have people like Dan Patrick creating these sports casting schools because he wants to bring back facts something that he has loved to do since he was in his late 20s. Well, I'll say this much. There's only two shows I pay much attention to on ESPN. One of them is Golik and Wingo, uh, and they're on four hours. And when I'm not networking, I like it because it allows me to draw ideas to what we do. And then part of the interruption, and I met uh, Tony Hornizer last year. I met uh, Mike Wilbon many years ago in Arizona, and I think I'll be seeing him this year in uh June at the National Sports Media Association's uh, awards banquet. So it'll be kind of neat. But, yeah, you're right. I want nuts and bolts, meaningful debate and information. I don't need all this screaming and all that business. And a guy that I uh, was luckily enough to meet last year was Bob Lee. And Bob Lee was the epitome of professionalism. But that's, you know, but that's neither here. But meanwhile, Jake, uh, well done tonight. And I look forward to seeing what you have uh, Next, um, on the next edition of the Sports Exchange, okay? Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me on again. Thank you very much, Jake. Have a great night, partner. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Meanwhile, Jake Ronholt is one of the uh, guys that I got to tell you, when he comes on the air, I've never seen a guy go out there and uh, show as much preparation as he does, and his energy level is definitely off the charts, so... 
Uh, our next guest will be Rick Curdy of the Charlotte Bats. Rick Curdy is my rant specialist. If there's anything to rant about, he definitely gets it done. Right, Candy? Oh, yeah, he does. He used to write for us, but he decided that um, writing isn't his style. He'd rather broadcast it live and rant up and down the river. Yeah, well, and that's exactly what he does, too. So, speaking of Rick Curdy, we will now speak to Charlotte Bats CEO Rick Curdy. And welcome to the Sports Exchange, Mr. Curdy. Hey, Scott. How are you? I'm doing fine, thanks. Also, are we going to talk about the National Drama League? Oh, you mean the NBA? Yeah, a.k.a. the National Drama League, <laughs> a.k.a. <laughs> The NBA. Oh, come on. You, you like to rant. i got to make sure I give you a reason to rant and give you what my definition is of it. Well, the NBA is a joke. Uh, one great thing they do in their All-Star game, they do a, lot, a great job publicizing their All-Star game, even though the slam dunk contest stinks. Um, but the NBA is so unwatchable. I haven't seen an NBA game in probably eight years. Um I used to enjoy watching it. The days of Barkley, who I couldn't stand, but at least he was entertaining. Jordan, Dominique, Isaiah, Larry Bird. Now it's just the drama league, like you said. Now everybody wants to be best friends. Everybody wants to play with each other. And it's a joke. And it's all scoring. There's no defense. I've never seen a league where it's, it's, if you hold up to like 115 points and, it, and it's like, oh, that's good. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's all shooting. Um, I remember seeing players score 50 points, and it was like, wow, that's amazing. Now you see it done every single night because that's all they want is shooting. You know, just like baseball where you see people, so many people hit 50 home runs now where in my time you hit 50, and it was like, wow. Now it's like, oh, okay, you hit 50 again. And that's how the NBA is getting with the 50 points or the 60 points where they score. And, and – Half the time, they don't even win the game. <laughs> wow. Well, look at poor, poor Bradley Beal scored uh, 50 points two straight nights, and they both and they lost the whole time, even though the Wizards, uh, even though they are a bad team. But it's just it's just unwatchable now. It's, it's bad, and I can't even imagine if, like, Larry Bird calling Magic Johnson up and saying, hey, Magic, uh, I heard you're going to be a free agent. Why don't you come to Boston and join me, and <laughs> together we can win the championship. That, I mean, that's sacrilegious. That's you know, true. they wanted to, they wanted to compete with each other and fight to the end, and they were good friends. They had a lot of respect for each other, but when they were on the court, uh, uh-uh, they they were enemies, and they wanted to they went out for each other. And that's how it should be. Now they're all buddies, and yeah. and now they all want to join each other. I want to see LeBron versus Anthony Davis, not LeBron and Anthony Davis. <laughs> right, that's and, a good point. You know, and so it's just it it stinks now. T- tell me how you really feel. All right, let's go ahead. And talk about uh, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson. I will say though that they at least they were uh, had an opportunity to play on the Olympics together, so that was definitely okay by me. But you're right. It, uh, back in the day, you built teams through the draft, and then you had that key trade, which enabled teams to get over the hump. I think one of the key trades that I saw uh, in recent years was Rasheed Wallace going to the Pistons. Uh, which filled out that championship roster. You know, you always like to see that key trade, and if stars get united that way, it's done the old-fashioned way, you know, and I have no problem with that, but not free agency, seriously. Now, you you talked about the 50 points, Rick. The 50-point number almost becomes devalued. It really did. And the reason why I say that, Rick, and I'm going to tie it to the NFL if I may, all right? Okay. You know, I was asking Eric Hipple earlier tonight about how many yards he would have and how many touchdowns he would have in today's NFL. Well, the numbers, he had 55 career touchdowns, and if I judge it by the 2020 standard, Rick, okay, Eric would have had 165 touchdowns instead of 55. And he took a beating back then. He had 10,711 yards. You know how many uh, yards, if we uh, figure out uh, by today's standards, I would say easily about 32,000. 
So, yeah. in other words, I'm telling you, Hipple took a beating out there. And, you know, if you know anything about Eric Hipple, he had one of the best Monday night performances ever when he threw for four touchdowns and ran for two others in a 48-17 to clubbing of the Chicago Bears, you know, back uh, in the uh, 80s. I believe it was 1981 on 10-19 of 81. So where am I going with a lot of this stuff? We're going to tie it back to your 50-point uh, stuff, and that being that the 50-point totals are so devalued. They really are. And, and when you want to make a valid comparison, it'd be like using steroids for numbers to inflate numbers, and then the quarterback yeah. yards number being – I mean, I'll give Kobe Bryant credit when he had 81 points. I'm okay with that, you know, because Kobe Bryant was an exceptional scorer, and he could carry a team on his back if he wanted – any good players around him. So I don't mind uh, uh, acknowledging Kobe Bryant's 81, but when you look at the whole league in general, they've gotten away from defense, Rick. That's what they've really oh, yeah. done. You know, the bad boys era, maybe I'm a little bit partial towards it, okay? But when you look at the bad boys era, that's good old hard-nosed basketball. When you had Bill Lambeard going at Kevin McNeil, and then all these wrestling matches with Rodman hitting the deck, and then the, uh, oh, with the Celtics, oh, Celtics-Pistons rivalry was one yep. heck of a mean rivalry, wasn't it? Tell me one more. Oh, yeah. And then the Pistons taught the uh, Lakers to play physical basketball, and that's when Pat Ryan, Pat Riley excuse me, took on that demeanor with the Knicks and subsequently with the Miami Heat. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, I love seeing that. Even the Bulls before Jordan won, was winning his championships, and uh, the Pistons had his number, and he'd frustrate him, frustrate the Bulls. He'd be getting to your head. Lane Beer was like that pest. And it would be like, what did I do? I didn't do anything. Boop, like an elbow to the face. I mean, they were the bad boys. I missed that era. I think the NBA would be great if they still had that. But it's so soft now where you feel like, uh, you know, breathe. You know, that's a technical foul. So, I mean, it's just so soft now. The officiating is terrible. And it's obviously they just want to focus on – on scoring, and that's why they keep talking about Harden. And you know, Harden's a great player, man. But he, you know, he's got more points shooting free throws than he has shooting, uh, uh, shooting three pointers. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's so inflated. A lot of these guys' numbers, and uh, it's just all scoring, no defense. I mean, it's like the All Star game. You know, they have that All Star game to score all those points. That's how the NBA regular season has become. It's, it's just there's no defense. There's no rivalries. I mean, the Knicks have been terrible for the past 20 years, and James Dolan needs to go. It's sad to see how bad they are because they were so competitive during the 90s. Um, Lakers look like they're coming back. So, But, I mean, it's just it's just unwatchable now. And a lot of these players I just can care less about. They care more about dunking, about how they look like how they dunk, than they do about their overall game. And I think a lot of it has to do with they have so much outside Thing. Now, this, now they got all this uh, social media and Instagram and Facebook, and it's all about branding themselves and about, you know, uh, they, they're into, like, clothing now. They're, like, clothing designers. So I think that has a lot to do with uh, why the, the NBA is how it is now. Well, don't lose sight of the fact that when the Pistons and the Bulls had their rivalries, and trust me, I sat in a bunch of those games um, back in the time when I was living in the Detroit area. It was a good time of basketball. Uh, Joe Dumars is the one that uh, helped create the Jordan rules, and the pit, and of course Dennis Rodman was all over the glass. So uh, yeah. I, I got to know a lot of those players on a regular basis, and there's nobody nastier than Rick Mahorn, you know. And Dennis Rodman to John me, Sally. I think is well, yeah. Well, Dennis Rodman I think is one of the best defensive players I've ever seen, and John Sally was a good complimentary. A uh, role player that knew how to just swat basketballs out and use his height to his advantage. So, yeah. you know, I, I can remember Joe Dumars telling me that he used to contact, they were in communication with their coaches, and they, he told them what he thought they, they had to do to stop Jordan. And lo and behold, yeah. they did. So, but yep. that was a good time of basketball for sure. So, what that else do you want to, yeah, what, what else do you want to rant about uh, what's wrong with the NBA? Oh, I mean, what, what what else can I say? I mean, uh, this, there's no, it's all scoring, no defense. Um, oh, I'm just so sick of these uh, superstars joining forces together. And 
I love LeBron, but he kind of started that trend with the, hey, come play with me. Let's team up together. Let's let's be buddies and let's win championships. And it's like Durant, you know. I mean, Durant's got two championships, but he got it in such a cheap way. You know, he got it in such a farce way. You know, yeah, I'm gonna join a team that beat me, and I'm gonna join a team that had 73 wins. You know, it was one of the best teams even without me. It's such a lame way to get it to get a championship now, and and um, I'm just sort of, and I'm just sick of seeing all these great players playing together. I, I mean, like, like Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. I want to see them facing each other, or or LeBron facing Anthony Davis, or what have you. So I just wish the, there was more rivalries now. Now everybody wants to be buddies, and I just want to see the Knicks come back. It was so fun when the Knicks were competitive. And James Dolan's like one of the worst owners in all of sports. I wish Adam Silver would just forced him to sell the team like he did with the uh, with the old Clippers coach, where he just told him, "I'll get out of here." And uh, it's just, it's just, and like I said, I haven't watched an NBA game in in like uh, eight years or so. I used to watch NBA and TNT all the time. It was great. It was fun. I couldn't stand Charles Barkley, but at least he was entertaining. Now I wish he was back. <laughs> You know, even though he's a big loudmouth, you know, and didn't win anything, he was still entertaining. And now it's just uh, a bunch of drama queens who are getting paid this ridiculous, and I do mean ridiculous amount of money. Yeah, Barkley was definitely a good player, and obviously he was worth his Hall of Fame credentials. Unfortunately, he never had a chance to win a ring. But I think the thing that is when you look at this entire league, and what it's become, I think, the biggest public relations debacle I have ever seen. If you can find one that tops it, go ahead and call me out on it, Rick. Okay? okay. Was when LeBron James, I'm going to take my act to South Beach and did it on television. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. you you got to give me a few minutes of a rant on that. If you can find a better PR debacle than that, go ahead. But right now I'm finding it hard to come up with one better. Yeah, he got criticized for that, though. But I had to say this, that ESPN's the one that reached out to him and told him, once you do, like, a presentation like that, and they paid him, like, about $4 million bucks, he actually donated that money to the Boys and Girls Club of Ohio. So um, I think that was more ESPN's uh, screw-up than anything. And you know what? He's a free agent. He can move on. I think, I think people made such a big deal about it, and people were angry with him. And you see people leave, leaving all the time. I remember Kevin Durant, the hypocrite, hypocrite Kevin Durant, actually criticized LeBron for doing that, and yet he does worse by going to a team that won seventy three wins. So, yeah, you right. know, um, yeah, I mean it's ridiculous. So, yeah, I didn't know uh, about the ESPN thing. That's news to me, Rick. Uh, if ESPN yeah, did redundant. go ahead, yeah, if indeed ESPN was behind that whole thing, as if I didn't really care about the network, anyways, that certainly gives me <laughs> another reason. Uh, to talk about it, I had Jake Reinhold before you came on the air, and I told him the only two shows I really care about on that network are Golick and Wingo, and pardon the interruption. I'll tell you why I like yeah. Golick and Wingo, because as you well know, it gives me ideas how I can go ahead and uh, you know work our program, the network, and how I can build our guest rapport and so forth, and our, make our show better. That's number one. Pardon the interruption yeah. to me has been good because... You know, uh, Bill Winters, you know, one of our regular uh, guests, to try to simplify things for him, you know, without him having a rant where he's ripping everybody on the planet. You know, in some cases it's justified, in some cases it isn't. You know, if I get Bill to pardon the interruption thing, and let me tell you, Bill's come a long way, just like a lot of people on our network, but if you give him the pardon the interruption theme, he knows that he has to keep his comments on the two or three minutes so that we can cover enough ground in the 30 to 35, 40 minutes that we allot for this show. So those are the two favorite shows I have, ESPN, only because I feel like I can benefit from them. You follow me? Yeah, I, I totally get it. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. Many years ago, uh, I loved the sports reporters. Again, you have three quality uh, newscasters of the moderator. First, it began with Dick Schaap and then John Saunders. It was too yeah. bad there, and I've always liked outside the lines because anything to me, Rick, that's educational that I feel like it gets out of, I'm all for it. Any of this super flashy garbage to me, uh, I don't like. There's that when I talked to Bob Lee last uh, summer in North Carolina, 
I referred to uh, a loud mouth individual that I can't stomach. And I said, Bob, you don't have to tell me who I'm referring to. And he looked at me in the eye and he was glad I was saying it because he didn't have to. And Bob was uh, inducted in the National Sports Media Association Hall of Fame. And, but he was really kind and gracious of his time to give it to me. And that was really good stuff, you know. So, But, you know, anything I could get a benefit out of Rick, I'm all for it. You know, otherwise you could discard a lot of that other stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I like I used to watch uh, up, uh, up Close with Roy Firestone. Oh, God, yeah. Thanks shows. for bringing that up. I used to love Up Close with Roy Firestone and then Chris Myers took it on. And the reason why I used to like that show a lot, too, is Roy Firestone is one of the best uh, interviewers that I have ever seen. And I have learned so much watching Roy uh, over the years so that I can try to go ahead and, you know, nobody will duplicate what the guy does, but anytime you can learn something from a professional like that, without a doubt, to me, again, you learn by watching and shadowing, and that's what you have to try to do is weed out a bunch of the dead weight that's out there. Yeah, those were good shows. I missed uh, the heyday of ESPN. I still watch it, but it's not the same anymore. It's just, uh, just a bunch of, now you see a bunch of people hollering and screaming and yelling and, and just acting like fools now, and uh, it's just, it, it's too much for me. But I miss the uh, up close. I miss uh, Shap Talks with Big Shap. Uh, right. I miss uh, uh, Sports Reporters was great. Uh, I miss John Saunders. Uh, right. Bob Lee is one of my favorites. And uh, yeah, you know, I miss those days of ESPN. And, um, you know, so uh, I- I'm with you on that part. Yeah, I used to schedule my mornings around uh, the Sports Reporter and outside the lines back then. I'm going to only mention a few commentators just because I want to get them out there then. I'm going to let you close your segment out with how they're going to promote you, okay? Uh, okay. I think the ones I've always enjoyed through the years were Tom Meese, Chris Berman, George Grand, Bob Lee. Am I missing a few? Probably, but those are the guys that uh, made ESPN what it was back in those earlier days. Gail Gardner was one of the finest, once one of the finest female that they had out there, and I think she's a pioneer in the industry, and I know... I'm probably missing a few, but uh, to me, just to watch those guys, they, they were fun to watch. With that said, we got about another minute or so to go, so why don't you go out there and promote everything that uh, is Rick Curdy. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me on your program. You're uh, you welcome. You can contact me at Charlotte Bats Baseball, www.charlottebatsbaseball.com. You can sign our petition to help us bring Major League Baseball to Charlotte. We're also on Twitter at Charlotte Bats Baseball. We're also on Instagram at Charlotte Bats, and we also uh, have a Facebook page, uh, just Charlotte Bats, and just drop a line, and uh, thank you for your support. All right. Well, obviously, uh, you're a regular on the sports exchange, but what I've decided to do is we're going to include you in the uh, baseball show that we have, 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. I think that you'll definitely uh, enjoy doing what you do best, and that's, uh, you know, uh, talking to Louis Adio Weiss. If anybody knows how to get to the kid who normally is unflappable, <laughs> uh, you definitely seem to know how to uh, push certain particular buttons. But you know what? I look at it the stat clown against the sarcasm clown. And Rick, let's not kid ourselves. Isn't it all about entertainment? Of course. And this would be a better fight than Fury and Wilder. And oh. I would not make any, and if I have an off night, I would not make any excuses that my costume was too heavy. Oh, that's a good one, man. Especially since we're <laughs> less than seven days from that fight. And I was waiting you to get that for you to get that costume reference in. So, indeed, <laughs> uh, Rick Curdy actually rants, but every now and then that journalistic part comes out of him when he makes a lot of facts sense with some of the facts that he does manage to throw out there from time to time. We're trying. We've tried to make Curdy a writer, but we figured, you know what, that's not his game. But meanwhile, Rick. Thanks for being on the Sports Exchange tonight, and we'll look forward to seeing what you got to bring to the table next week. Okay, Rick? Thanks, guys. Uh, have a good one. I'll talk to you next you week. Too. You bet. Bye. All right. Bye. All right, our next guest here on the Sports Exchange is our Jacksonville Jaguars correspondent, David Levin. David obviously covers baseball, and he is the regular beat writer for the Jacksonville Jaguars. He works with Black 
and teal.com. And one thing I can tell you is I met David Levin at last year's draft up in Jacksonville covering the Jaguars. And I can tell you if there's ever an individual more thorough than uh, David, then uh, show me that him. And I've seen a lot of good journalists over the years. And I think what's important to really acknowledge is that we try to go ahead and make sure that the information is fresh and we try to keep it uh, at the top of the forefront. So, so far, been a great night. We had obviously uh, Rick Hurdy, and now we welcome David Levin to the Sports Exchange. And now I want to welcome David Levin, a man of many hats, uh, to the Sports Exchange. David, glad to have you back on the Sports Exchange. Before uh, we'll let you t go ahead and tell everybody who you represent first, and then we'll get to the nuts and bolts. You're welcome. Um, I write for Fan Sided. I cover the NFL and Major League Baseball. Uh, my handle on Twitter is DM719907. Okay. So, uh, want to talk a little football? Absolutely. All right. Uh, how are you doing tonight, Candy? Well, she's in the other room, but uh, okay. she probably hears you in the background. Uh, All right. Well, I didn't, want, I didn't want to leave her out this time. Oh, no, no, don't worry. You'll, you'll have a chance to talk with her at the very end of the program. I can guarantee you that. Okay, great. So um, let's talk a little combine, NFL draft, uh, what's going on. Right now, um, we know the nuts and bolts of what's going on in terms of what the Jaguars are starting to do with free agency. You know, they released Marcel Darius. Jake Ryan, they saved themselves about $25 million, so now all of a sudden they have cap space, but the uh, scouts are there, head coach uh, Doug Marone, general manager David Caldwell, um, and other league, you know, team officials are in, in Indianapolis taking a look at, you know, all the prospects, uh, the wide receivers, the quarterbacks, the offensive players are, are, you know, running their drills, and you're getting to see you know, what's available, whose stock might be rising, some that, you know, may, may not have been, uh, have not have done well, but uh, it's uh, an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic because you know the one position that they don't need is quarterback. So they're looking at wide receivers and tight ends, they may look at a running back, um, but all is geared towards the NFL draft now. So they pretty much have an idea of what they're going to try and do in free agency, at least I hope they do, um, because if they don't, we're in big trouble. So um, that's where we, you know, that's where we start the process, Scott. Uh, you and I both know that this is an offense that really needs help, but it may be the, the, the defense that is tagged first. Um, I'm not so much worried about the ninth pick in the draft like you and I talked about. Right. Jaguars have two selections, one at nine and one at 20. They're going to get themselves a stud player. They're, this is a deep draft for um, quality players probably through the first 20 picks and you can shake it up and you know take your pick somebody that maybe 30 on their draft and somebody else to draft for maybe 21 on yours you know it's it's really it's a pick of the litter and what what you tend to think fits better for your scheme so you want to talk a little bit about uh what we can do at number 20 as opposed to number nine yeah i can do that and by the way candy did uh is back in the house I'm doing good. How are you? I didn't want to leave you left out. I, I, you were the first person I said hello to. I know. I heard that, but I was in the other room. Sorry, I was uh, updating it's the right. website. Got to do what you got to do. So let's say for the sake of argument, the Jaguars use their ninth pick on defensive tackle, Derek Brown of Auburn, who's considered to be the best defensive tackle in the draft. And I, I think he'll be there. While many... Uh, Mock drafts have Isaiah Simmons of Clemson, the uh, linebacker slash safety slash defensive guy, because that's what he listed himself as when he did his interview the other day. It was pretty actually it was pretty fantastic. When I asked him what he played, he goes defense, and that's all he said. And everybody kind of chuckled, but it, it, it is exactly what he does. He doesn't serve a purpose in middle linebacker, and that's the biggest need for the Jaguars. And if they're going to move him outside, does that mean that we keep Miles Jack in the middle? That's one of the bigger questions. I think that we shy away from that. So let's say they get a defensive tackle at nine, and then you've got twenty where you can you can interchange players. 
Um, I see there's four or five guys that are likely going to be there. Um, I got to throw Patrick uh, Queen in there. He's a linebacker from LSU. He's steadily rising on people's boards. Um, you know, anybody that played on the LSU defense this year, uh, you know, is going to get attention. Just like anybody who would play for Alabama in a championship year is going to get attention. Um, he's a solid pick. I, mean, I think he might be a little undersized. I probably would have. Um, I probably would look towards free agency first before I looked to draft an inside linebacker um, in the draft. Then there's um, Christian Fulford of LSU, who is a cornerback. And that makes a lot more sense. Scott, you know that we have major issues in the secondary because some guy named, you know, Jalen Ramsey uh, decided he didn't want to stay in Jacksonville and kind of created a, a cluster for our secondary. Um, uh, Fulton is 6'2 and 200 pounds. He's a big boy. Um, packs a wall up. Um, I don't know whether they will retain A.J. Bouye on the other side, but if they do retain him, maybe at a reduced rate if they're able to renegotiate his contract. Those are two solid cornerbacks. Um, Ful- Fulton's probably probably the second-rated cornerback behind Jeffrey Okuda from Ohio State, who is there's Okuda, and then there's the next level. It's not even it's not even close to separation between one and two. Then there could be there could be a myriad of players um, for on, on the line itself. They could also try and go the offensive route too, Scott. You know. You have said it too that they need playmakers. So what's available? Um, I definitely think that Jeffrey Judy will be gone, and, and I know you're you're big on him. Um, you know. Yeah, well, I saw the guy in person. He was fantastic. Yeah, I know. He's, he's impressive. But what would you think about taking Harry, uh, Henry Ruggs, his uh, tag team partner, uh, at twenty if he's available? He's a speed burner. He's a little bit smaller, but he can play on the outside. He can't play in the slot. And Jacksonville just, they need speed on the, they need speed in the passing game. This would give them another playmaker with DJ Chark, uh, Chris Conley, and D.D. Westbrook. And that's four guys that run the 40 and under 4-4. That's just, that's just speed. And to uh, basically steal John Madden's game quote, speed kills. Right. And wouldn't it be great to have four wide receivers just running all over the field like, like they were, you know, uh, speeding Gonzalez trying to catch footballs in, in, in Jacksonville. I think that would make people forget about two home games being played in London real quick if people were catching footballs all over the place. Yeah, I think Ruggs would be an interesting addition for them. You know, if you can get a guy like him at 20 or wherever they're what, – where do you think they're projecting to pick up Ruggs if they decide to go after him? That's my question to you. I've seen Ruggs anywhere between 17 and 22. So okay. He fits, he fits right now. Granted – I don't know what he's going to run tonight, and if he, you know, if he runs a four-two-nine, then you know he's going to go right up the board. But conceivably, I see him in the middle of the round, and and he could slide to twenty, especially if there are four quarterbacks and four offensive linemen who are taken in the first, you know, fifteen picks. Well, I mean, to answer your question, I I think that Rugs could be a good addition, and yes, you do, David, want to be able to uh, spread the ball out with a bunch of gazelles running all over the place. And I, I, one of my favorite lines I like to use is a bunch of horses grazing all over the field, man. And he'd be, he'd be grazing all over these cornerbacks and safeties, making life difficult. Now, you also have to go ahead and provide Foles or Minshew or both with, with a target because I, I've been saying this a lot as we continue to post the – transcripts on there and you've seen it out there that this is a make or break year for David Caldwell and for Doug Marone these guys are in desperation mode David that's all there is to it so they're you know the the screwing around is done okay and Shad Khan knows it so if you've got a potential playmaker out there that you can nab at that time David uh, why not Well, I think he'd be a sleeper for a lot of um, teams if they could get him in the 20s and 30s. I also think that there's another wide receiver that may creep into this conversation. Um, T. Higgins from Clemson, um, he really came on this year. He was an all-ACC performer. He's 6'4 and 215, and they're comparing his size to um, 
uh, DeAndre Hopkins at, 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 of Houston, who also played at Clemson. Um, he's not as fast, but he's big. I mean, he's thick. And if you can win 50-50 balls in the air when you're you know playing against smaller cornerbacks or safeties, that's what you want, too. He's more... Um, what do you want to say? He's... he's He's better than, than Alan Hearns was. How about that? A little bit taller, a little bit thicker. But he's got the same kind of skill set, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was there. They may take a shot at him, given the fact that Ruggs may be gone. Well, you got to have backup plans, right, uh, David? Always got to have a plan B, right? Yeah. You got Rick, David, I, all my uh, thoroughbreds are on tonight. But no, David, do you have... No, but you have to have backup plans, and that's why you have that thing called a big board, right? Right. Um, it's a chess at match. Have, <laughs> at some point, they're going to have to take an offensive lineman. I do think that the, the free agent route will be one way they look at adding offensive linemen that are not going you know, to break the bank type of players. You know, they'll find middle of the road. Uh, graders who can fill in a tackle or a guard uh, that they're maybe low risk, high reward. But you'll see them bring in two or three of them. And then you can see them try and maybe the second, third, or fourth round, try and beef up their offensive line. And then after that, you know, really it's a crapshoot because they say, as you know, and, and Candy seen it on the field too, they have so many needs. And we keep on saying that. And I just wish that the agency would start so we could at least see what they're filling up you know the gas tank is less than half full here people um and you're right it's de it's there's despair if you want to use that word with this uh, organization it's fractured it needs to be reset and i don't necessarily think a rebuild is going to get completed in one year through a draft class and a, and a free agency market with only right right now 25 million dollars to spend yeah, but I'll tell you what, last year, though, during the draft, they did pick up some good pieces. So I think right. with Gardner Minshew coming later on, a very smart quarterback, he uh, performed admirably, especially later in the draft. So you, you were able to address a couple of needs. And I think, right. honestly, you have two quarterbacks. You're trying to figure out who you want. You have Fournette who can run. But if you don't have a line that opens the holes for Fournette or that protects either Foles or Minshew, it doesn't matter how many wide receivers you have. I agree. Did you see the transcript from, um, I believe it was David Caldwell, who said he was happy with what they have on the offensive line right now? Did you read that part? I, I didn't have a chance. No, no I missed so that part. Go ahead and uh, fill me in okay, on well, that. Okay, well, guess what? <laughs> what? You, you said he was, they were pleased with what they have on the offensive line right now. Um, but I wasn't drinking coffee when I read it. Uh, you and I both know that offensive line is atrocious. Oh, yeah. And, and it's, you know, <laughs> it's a good thing that Gardner was, is, is a mobile quarterback or there wouldn't be six wins on the board. Well, why, uh, why was Foles hit so early in the year if you have such a good offensive line? Okay, I, I'm going to defend him on this one. I'm going to defend the offensive line on that one. He held the ball too long. And we, we've been saying that the whole time. The reason why he got hit was... He waited for Chark, and Chark was tangled up in the corner. Scott and I saw it above. Right. But he waited and waited and waited. I mean, he threw the ball like it was. It's, it's kind of like a wrestler who kicks out, like, just as the referee's hand's going down on the ground. He let the ball go just at the last minute. I don't necessarily think that that was the offensive line's fault. However, they could have gotten Gardner killed several times this year if, <laughs> if he wasn't a mobile quarterback. Right. Because, uh, that, that, that kid, uh, he had nine lives. I'll just say that. Right. Well, uh, David, Candy brings up an interesting point, so maybe you can clarify. Uh, what's going on with Leonard Fournette? I mean, did they, uh, did they? I don't know if they exercised his uh, last year option or, or are they looking to renegotiate? Because Leonard Fournette I, was one of the better players on their roster, and I would think you'd want to keep him in the fold for a while. So w inform me about where uh, Leonard Fournette uh, factors into the Jaguars' future. Okay, this is what I know, which is not a lot. Remember last year, right before the start of the first round, they announced that they had uh, picked up Jalen Ramsey's fifth-year fifth option. Right. And, and that was the big news, because they weren't, you know, they were going to make sure 
manager that he wasn't getting a contract and he wasn't this and he wasn't that. So they picked up his fifth year option, which would have paid him thirteen point seven million this year, which boy, really would have hurt the salary cap here this year. They haven't done anything much with Leonard yet. I know that he has done. He did everything they accept, accept, expected him to do with you know playing fifteen or sixteen games. So after the season, he had the flu when he was out. You can't can't fight it, you know, illness in one run. Right. I would have thought I would have heard more by now. But running backs, as you and, and I'll address it to Candy, I guess. As you know, running backs are a dime a dozen. You can pick them up off the street. Detroit is famous for that. Green Bay did that for a while. Denver has made it chic to pick a guy up and let him run for a year or two and then pick up another running back and run him for a year or two or whatever. New England gets by with, you know, scraps off the street. They haven't decided yet whether they want to pick up his fifth-year option. I think it's going to be another show-me season. You know, he, he had 1,152 yards on the ground. He caught 76 passes. He didn't get in the end zone, and that's the biggest thing. And I don't know whether they're saying that he needs, you know, to be able to, to push the line through or it's the line's fault or whatever. But you haven't heard anything about it. And he also hasn't been on social media discussing it because usually, you know, Leonard – Leonard likes Twitter. <laughs> they all do. Right. But uh, he, he's not discussing anything. It's, it's an interesting dynamic. I know that the maturity level that he has shown over the last 12 months, I would think would warrant them coming to him and say, look, we want to negotiate a new deal if we don't pick up your fifth-year option. This is what we would like to do and see what he says. Because right. I ultimately think – well, go ahead. Just go ahead and I'll, well, I'll, I'll follow. Well, that's okay. Well, number one, the Detroit Lions will pick off running backs off the streets. The last time they had a thousand-yard rusher was when Reggie Bush pulled the trick, and the last time they had a real running back was when a guy by the name of Barry Sanders was running, was running for fifty thousand. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what street you're looking at, but not the same one I'm looking at. But that's okay. Just want to set the record straight on a franchise that I've that that I've lived with my whole life, but. Yeah, but no, I, I'm with you. I, I, you know, running backs. Now the Denver Broncos are an interesting uh, example because they used to draft them late in the draft, and right. because the system was friendly, it's different. But not so case of the Detroit Lions. They've they've tried hard. I got to give them credit. They had Javid Vest and Amir Abdullah, but those guys never panned out. So and Kevin Smith was a heck of a running back out of Central Florida, but he couldn't stay healthy. But that's what's. So I just want to set the record straight on that. So thank you. I, I feel I feel better now that I understand it. Better. Oh no, yeah. that's okay, David. It's not a big no, deal. I'll give you a hard time. It's not. Oh no, I don't care. It's all good dialogue, brother. Don't worry about that's it. That's okay. I give him a hard time all the time. Candy. Candy. Right. Yep. Let me ask you this, Candy. They have Fournette, and then they've got uh, um, uh, I can't pronounce his name right. Rockwell, Rockwell Armstead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then they don't have anybody else. And I don't feel comfortable with just having two running backs. You know, they have they have journeymen who, you know, to enter the game and help out on special teams and whatnot. I wouldn't be surprised if in the fourth round you saw them draft a, a running back that they can groom. I don't know if Armstead um, is the answer if they didn't pick up Fournette's option and they let him test free agency. Because honestly, if, they, if he tests free agency after this year, he's not staying. Well, because he's, 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 he's gone. He's as good as gone. And he'll do well somewhere else, too. I can tell you, Fournette, uh, you give him uh, a really good team, and the Jackson will be licking their chops. I will say one thing about David Caldwell, though, and that's this. He's got this year to figure it out, and he acquired those – Draft choices in the Ramsey trade. This is if there's ever a guy under more fire than Marone, it's Caldwell. Because I told David Caldwell when I was over uh, after a game that I thought, "Boy, you fleece the Rams." And I, and he, and I, he was basically thinking to me, "I hope you're right," <laughs> because the return that they got for uh, Ramsey was pretty good, and the Rams were desperate and they were prepared to cough it up. So. Yeah, you know, because they don't—I don't believe they have a first-round draft pick for the next three years. Right. They, they're pretty well. They're screwed. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can say it. Well, it's the are, truth. They, no, they—they they, they, what they did 
is they traded their future for an established player, a playmaker, and a really good one. I think Jalen Ramsey's going to have a decent career with the Rams, and I think he'd be with the Jaguars if Tom Coughlin didn't get in the way and treat him like you know what. But uh, that's for another point. So now you also talked about uh, the Jaguars getting a defensive tackle with the uh, ninth pick, and then. Uh, right. So why don't you elaborate on what you uh, were alluding yeah. to there? Okay, what I think is going to happen is this. I think the, excuse me, the interior of the defensive line is the biggest need. I, I could make a case that left tackle is the biggest need, but um, they'll disagree with me that Cam Robinson probably deserves another year. Gardner better learn how to run a little bit faster if that's the case. But anyway, um, I think Garrett Brown's the guy that they're going to target. I, I, I see the mocks, and I see Isaiah Simmons, and I just say, he's a great player, but for some reason it just doesn't fit there for me. So Brown is the best defensive tackle. He was an all-SEC performer. Um, he played against top-notch competition every week. You know, Javon Kimmel of, of South Carolina is, is a close second, but he probably is a, you know somewhere between 12 and 17 or 18 pick. Um Brown is a little more, uh, he's a little more polished. Uh, he's a little faster. They're about the same size. So you need somebody that's going to walk in and plug in that middle because Marcel Darius is not coming back. And, I, and I'm sorry to Gator fans who may hear this, but Taven Bryant starting for, for Jacksonville scares the hell out of me. Right. Um, you know, I think that's a wasted pick. So you you got to fortify the, the interior line first, and then you go and you find the complementary players, whether it's, you find a linebacker at 20 or you find a cornerback at 20 or you shift gears and you find yourself a tackle or a cornerback. Um, I threw Ruggs in there because they do need a playmaker. I still don't necessarily think that you get a wide receiver at 20, you wait till the second or third round because it's, it's a fairly deep class in terms of, of who you can find. And the Jaguars, for everything that they do over the years, and, and I know that you You've seen it over the years. Whoever has been drafting seems to do better drafting after the first round than their yeah. second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. You know, those are the players that develop and become, you know, the ones that Jaguars count on. You know, there have been so many missed opportunities with their first round picks. Dante Fowler didn't pan out here, although he did really well in LA. Blake Bortles was the third pick. You know, we could go down the line into the, you know, late 1990s and early 2000s. You know, with, with wide receivers, Reggie Williams didn't pan out. Um, just players that they took a fire. Like R.J. Sauer did in 97, but we'll give him a pass on that one. Well, there are a lot of organizations, though, David, they uh, uh, don't hit on that in the first round. I can tell you right now over the years, as Bill Winters and I were doing some bus uh, the yeah. other day, that at the top, uh, the Lions have blown a couple. Jacksonville, of course, has. But the Cincinnati Bengals are known for not getting it right in the first round either. And for a lot of you folks that right. want to hear the uh, uh, our show with Bill Winters last night, uh, uh, I'll go ahead and look on the South Florida Tribune Network and we talk about some of the uh, uh, busts that occurred over the years. And there's some organizations that are notorious for getting it wrong. I think the New York Jets factored into the equation a little too. So. If you don't get that first round pick right, it sets you back a long ways. You really do. Now, the second round pick, you don't pay it as much, so, you know, they're considered bargain basement players. Right. So. The Jaguars did well in the second. You've seen the Jaguars do well in the second round over the years. Rasheed Mathis was a second round pick, DJ Chark's a second round pick. Right. Um, you know, they, they, they've hit, I, I think, Bo Williams. He might have been a second round pick, but I'm not, I don't, don't hold me to that. They, they've hit over the years on, on second round picks. It's just everybody puts so much emphasis on that first pick because oh, yeah. he's, he's a franchise player. It's supposed to be, you know, they, Derek Henry, the Harvey didn't plan, pan, out, pan out for them. Uh, Reggie Nelson didn't pan out for them. You know, uh, Matt Jones didn't pan out know, Matt Jones. <laughs> um, you know, just this poor, poor judgment, I guess you would say. Uh, Maurice Jones-Drew was a second-round pick, and, and we know what a great career he had. So it really is finding the right piece to the puzzle at the right time. Um, I'm just hoping that 
they have another draft class like they did last year. Well, that was a good class. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to add this, though. I don't think Blake Bortles is all that bad. I really don't. I mean, was he a superstar? No. I mean, you know, he did win a couple of playoffs games. How many quarterbacks through the years have won a couple of playoffs games? And he took them all the way to the uh, uh, to, to the uh, brink of an AFC title. It just he didn't wor- it didn't work out. But he's gone. So, but I don't think Blake Bortles is all. I've seen a whole lot worse than Blake Bortles. I'll tell you that. So one other question for you. And that's this. Right. Uh, who do you think they're going to try to get with the 42nd pick in the second round? The second round, okay. Yeah, I mean, you were talking about, okay, I want to make sure we get it cl- straight that uh, right. you weren't sure with the uh, ninth pick. Uh, you're talking about offensive lineman or defensive back with the second pick. We've right. talked about that. Uh, and of the two, uh, they uh, uh, if they don't get it yet, they would- will uh, try to get with the 42nd pick in the second round. So why don't you take that, and then we'll close okay. out the program. I, sure. What I, think, what I think will happen is if there is a, let's say, a, 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 a shuffle. When I say by shuffle is there's four or five guys at, at you know, 20 that they like, and they take the highest-rated player on the board because best player available may actually fit and help them um, down the line. If it is... If it's not a cornerback and they're able to get a linebacker or an offensive lineman, then maybe they get um, uh, Trayvon Diggs, who's a cornerback from Alabama in the, in the second round. Um, I can't pronounce his name, good golly, but the kid from Colorado, the speed burner wide receiver, um, and his name escapes me, he could be there at 42, although uh, if he runs a league at 40, then he's probably the, the end of the first round. You also can see the Jaguars possibly trade back in, Scott, because there's not much difference between 32 and 42. That's true. You, you know, and they remember, they've got some draft capital they can give up. Maybe they offer, um, they switch third-round picks with somebody to move up. You know, just, I'll take your pick, you take mine. Or maybe they offer, you know, draft capital from 2021. I don't know. But if somebody's there that they think they can win now with, you might see Dave Caldwell become a gambler. Well, you remember, you're talking 42-32. I guess the only difference between the two rounds is I believe the contracts are a year longer in the first right. round versus the second round. But at that point, it really doesn't matter anyways. And I think exactly. the one thing that we've, we're not mentioning that I'll mention before we wrap up the broadcast is while Doug Marone's under pressure, could he be looking at his successor and Jay Gruden and, of course, there's Ben McAdoo. So I would like to think that Ben McAdoo and Jay Gruden are under as much pressure with Marone to make sure all these things we're talking about in terms of offensive production change drastically, not only from the quarterback position, but the running attack as well as potential aerial attack. So. Let me throw this in here real quick. You know how Doug Marone has much more say in play, player personnel this year. Right. I wonder how much more input Todd Wash and Jay Gruden are going to have in making these selections this year. Uh, oh, I mean, well, you don't worry. You'll, you're gonna, we're gonna find out in a matter of weeks. I'm just curious to see what, where the combine takes us and see if certain guys draft. I can prove, although I don't personally put a lot into the combine anyhow. Uh, I think I put as much uh, stock in the pro days as the combine. Uh, the only thing the combine, in my opinion, is good for is the fact that these players are going to interview with all 32 teams on site in Indianapolis. But, you know, there have been some guys whose stock have driven in the driven up in the combine, and there, who knows what hidden gems are out there. But meanwhile, David, uh, once again, nice job here tonight. Thanks. And we look forward to uh, doing it again next week here on the South Florida Tribune Broadcasting Network. You are listening to live coverage of the Sports Exchange. So on behalf of our guests tonight, Jake Ronholt, Rick Curdy, and Dave Levin, this is Scott Morgan Roth and Candy Ebling saying good night, everybody, and look forward to having you back on the next edition of the Sports Exchange. Good night, everybody. Good night.